Now, Gary Steingart's super sad true love story has just made it to another of the week's shortlists, the Bollinger Woodhouse Prize for Comic Fiction. As anyone who knows and loves Steingart's work will expect, it is indeed very funny. It's also a love story of sorts. Its protagonist, Lenny Abramov, is a Nabashi Russian-American on the brink of 40. He's already terrified of his own mortality, but then he falls for Eunice Park, a beautiful but brittle second-generation Korean-American who is just 24 and does nothing for his anxieties. And the backdrop to this quite personal story is a world where nothing is private, a dystopian vision of America where your everyday life is constantly updated to the world. When Lindsay Irving met Steingart, he began by asking why this love affair is played out in such a very public way. I think that if you're going to do a, a dystopian kind of novel, or you, have to, um, you have to ground it in something personal. Uh, 1984 and Brave New World are two wonderful dystopian novels. Brave New World may work better as a novel of ideas. I think Huxley was very good at predicting so many things. Uh, 1984 was not really a great novel of ideas. He Orwell took what was already there, Stalinist Russia, and extrapolated from there. But you remember 1984 more because of the love story, or at least I do. It's the fact that Winston uh, and Julia are so in love and that there's a society trying to drag them apart. That's one of the sort of the glue that holds the book together for me. And it's interesting because in, uh, in that book, it's sort of its big brother. It's the government that's uh, invading people's privacy. But uh, in this book, everyone is more than eager to give up their privacy to show everything they can about themselves, which is, I guess, the society in which we live. And you've told the story in two streams, one in the diary anachronistically kept by Lenny and Eunice's text-speaky exchanges with her friends and family. Um, that's a key mechanism of the story, isn't it? Yeah, I wanted to sort of contrast uh, the way people used to write, uh, the slow, plodding way of, 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 of novelists and diarists, and, and this is something that no longer exists in this world. Lenny is keeping the world's last diary. And I wanted to contrast that and also capture the way we now communicate. Uh, Eunice is actually considered one of the smartest people of her generation because she can write something as lengthy as in five or six sentence email. And, and she is... Lenny calls her my reluctant sentence monger because she uses both a subject and a predicate in some of her sentences, which is considered fantastic by the standards of, fantastically long by the standards of the, the way people text and communicate in this future. One of the key things that seems to have displaced literacy in the, or literate culture in, in the world you're portraying is this ubiquitous device, the apparat, if right. that's the right way of pronouncing yeah. it. Um, can you tell me a bit more about that? The apparat is a wonderful device, which uh, its greatest feature is Rate Me Plus. And it's a rating system that w the apparat is worn like a pendant around your neck. And let's say I walk into a, well, I don't know, Shoreditch House or Soho House <laughs> in London. Uh, what would happen in the future is that immediately everyone in Shoreditch House ranks me. So I'm known as the, automatically as, let's say, the seventh ugliest man in the room. <laughs> but I have maybe the ninth best credit rating and the fourth best hipster rating and all this kind of different stuff. So it's a way for people to rank everybody else around them, uh, which I think is already happening in so many different ways. You know, I applied for a mortgage. I have a, three different credit ratings. Uh, I have an Amazon rating for my book, ranking for my book. I have a, there's something called ratemyprofessor.com where I can be ranked by my students. Um, so every aspect of one's self is, is immediately ranked. And that ranking in this future is immediately broadcast everywhere. So who you are is immediately known. And people also sp tell everything about themselves. So you yes. enter a bar and my, my, um, you know, all your child abuse background is automatically broadcast uh, to everyone in the room. I mean, private life doesn't really exist in no. the world of the apparatus. Even, even having sex with someone is also can be broadcast so that people know what you're like when you're having sex and they can ascertain yes. whether you're fit in with their you know, schedule. And yes, and looking desires. later in the evening, if, you, if you're not already right. <laughs> having sex, you can check your fuckability factor on the... The uh, fuckability ranking is very important, and Lenny throughout the book struggles with a very low fuckability ranking. <laughs> Eunice, and what he does sometimes is, because Eunice is so hot, that he'll stand next to Eunice and his fuckability goes up immediately because people sort of conflate their looks. And yes, well, you can see that that's... Uh, an eternal truth. That one, I tried it? that in Shortage House as well. It, it, works, <laughs> it, it worked quite well. It works for rock stars, doesn't it? Works it works for rock stars. And are you, are you plugged into this kind of technology yourself? Because you can see that the, the, it's only a notch or two 
up on the, on the volume knob from uh, the, sure. the, the, the iPad or the smartphone to the apparatus? Well, when I started writing this book, I had to do everything. I, I didn't know anything. And so I hired a, an intern, a young man, who showed me how this... Uh, he got me an iTelephone, and we got into the intertube quite well, and Facebooking and stuff. Um, I have a Facebooking account. Um, you should all look at it. It's amazing. You, you have <laughs> right. to like me. Can, I, can, can we friend you? You can, you can fan me. Uh, right. I won't be your okay. friend, but you can, li you can like <laughs> me, and then when you like me, I, I'm your f you can follow me. Um, and it's interesting. I, I, it's mostly pictures of my dachshunds, very beautiful tell-all photos of my right. dachshunds <laughs> at, at work and play, you know. So, but you're it, preserving some anachronistic vestiges of uh, privacy. Yeah, yeah, some, but but it really <laughs> changed my life in getting all these devices because I realized that um, there's a kind of instant gratification. You know, I pick, I, I put up a picture of my dachshund, and somebody says, "Oh, he's so cute," <laughs> and there's a kind of immediate instant gratification. Whereas writing a novel takes many years, and and some critics at the Guardian may not even like it. So <laughs> you know, that's a disaster. Yes, that I mean, it seems that the, that loss of privacy is an even more radical loss than literacy in a way. Reading something, in, in a, it requires a kind of privacy. It requires you to withdraw electronically from the world around you and to enter, enter another person's mind. And this is sort of, you always feel like you're entering another person's mind because everything is so public, but in essence you're just entering the superfluous information, the superfluous stream of data that we all just project from ourselves, but it doesn't really help getting to know anyone. I mean, as, as a prophet, I can only look maybe two months ahead of time, which isn't a very helpful prophecy making. But when, uh, right after the book came out, in, in the book, women, young women wear something called onion skin jeans, which are just completely transparent. They're, you know, they leave nothing to the imagination. And right two months after the book came out, the New York Times did an article about the Paris Fashion Week and how, and they quoted the book because apparently something like exactly like that already existed two months after the book's publication, completely transparent jeans. The people that Lenny sees in, uh, who are employed and rich in New York are able to uh, spend vast sums of money preserving their youth. But just off stage in this novel, or just seen at the corner of the wings, is are uh, the, the other half of American mm -hmm. society who are comp live a completely separate existence. Yeah. The have-nots are, are, I mean... Radically, they're becoming a separate nation, almost, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, no, the book uh, has two, two qualities of people. The HNWIs, the high net worth individuals, which comprise a very small part of America's population, and the LNWIs, the low net worth individuals. And Lenny is somewhere in the middle of the two. He's one of the rare category, the, the, that tiny little remainder of the middle class that exists in this future. It's interesting because, you know, when I, I was born in Russia and emigrated as a child, and I always thought that Russia would become sort of more and more like America, you know, develop a middle class. And, but in the end, America became more and more like Russia, you know, a country where there is a kind of growing oligarchy of, of very wealthy people, and the rest are slowly becoming poorer and poorer and, and have fewer and fewer opportunities. So, uh, And meanwhile, China is... China is incredible. When I've been there, and it's just, uh, wow, they really want it, you know. As Americans, we really wanted it a century ago. We really wanted to everything, and we got it for a time. And but you know, inevitably, somebody else will want it more. And uh, Asia wants it more right now. Lenny and Eunice's worlds are wildly different, but uh, they do have in common the immigrant experience, which is something they share with you. Uh, is is that something that's important to your writing? Yeah. No. It's a being an immigrant novel is, is pretty hot in America. This is uh, so much of our fiction is, you know, Juno mm -hmm. Diaz and Jhumpa Lahiri and Chang Ray Lee. And uh, it really... Is that because, I mean, that, that, that's a generation of American experience? Yeah, you know, there used to be a lot of uh, the, the, the sort of Jewish wave of writers, Philip Roth and Saul Bellow and Malamud. And, and now there's a new immigrant uh, wave, um, Asia, Latin America, and in my case from the former Soviet Union. And... We're, we're rocking the American literary scene. Um, yeah. The native-born have given up on writing fiction, so <laughs> they're too busy twittering about it. So. Yeah. And did, did that, uh, your own sort of, I think the expression is uh, hyphenated experience, give you the confidence um, to write about a 24-year-old Korean woman, which I imagine in a country as self-conscious about ethnicity and identity as the U.S. must have taken a certain amount of nerve yeah, no, I, I've sort of appropriated the kind of role of the er-immigrant, so I can speak for all, <laughs> I, I can 
be the ventriloquist and speak for all immigrants anywhere, um, which maybe not all immigrants are happy about, but I'm, I'm uh, and I've known Koreans for so long and have gone to a, a high school that was almost all Asian, it's a math and science high school, of course. So uh, I, I feel very connected to this culture. Uh, Korean culture also fascinates me because it reminds me a lot of Soviet Jewish culture. There's a an overemphasis on education. There's a feeling of being a, a small nation surrounded by larger nations, Japan and China in Korea's case. And, and the family looms very the large. The family looms there. large, and there's also a love affair with cabbage, which, which <laughs> and, and I think that the Koreans which would be with kimchi do a much better. Which another ethnicity to understand. Exactly, no, cabbage binds us. Lindsay Irving talking there to Gary Stengart.